Hey, it's Michelle, you're a CNC biology tutor. In this video, I'll be looking at 15 more diagrams that you need to know for your biology exams. So we'll be picking up from where we left off in the previous video. So let's get started. So we're going to start off with the topic of movement. And we're going to be looking at some of the key bones that make up the human skeleton. So let's begin with A is pointing at the skull, which consists of the cranium and the orbits. So B is the orbits where the eyes would be, commonly known as the eye sockets. So the cranium would be at the top part of the skull and that is responsible for protecting the brain. And then we have the mandibles where the jaws would be, the jawbone. So let's look at C. C is pointing at the clavicle or the collarbone. D is pointing at the sternum, which is the breastplate. E that's locating the ribs of the rib cage, and the rib cage is important for protecting those vital organs such as the lungs and the heart. F is pointing at the pelvis or the pelvic girdle, also known as our hip bone. G is the femur, the largest bone in the body, and that is our thigh bone. And we have H locating the tibia or the shin bone. So right next to H is not labeled. Next to H is the fibula, the small of the two bones. Now going over to this side, I is pointing at the bones of the vertebral column known as the vertebrae. So those specific vertebrae would be the cervical vertebrae in the neck. Then you go down the upper back, which will be the thoracic vertebrae. Those are the bones that interconnect with the rib cage. And then also we have the lumbar vertebrae. These are the larger bones, the sacrum, and then the cockets would be the tailbone right at the end. You're not seeing it clearly in this particular diagram. All right, so I is representing the vertebrae. So those are the bones of your spine. J is locating the humerus, also known as your funny bone. So that's your upper arm bone. And then we're gonna look at the two lower arm bones, the ulna and the radius. So K, K is the ulna and L, the radius, is the smaller of the two bones. So always remember the ulna is the one that forms the point of the elbow. So it's the large of the two bones and it forms the point of the elbow. All right, let's move on to the next diagram. So sticking to the topic of movement, we're gonna look at the upper arm particularly focusing on the joints and the muscles at the upper arm. So muscle X is pointing at the biceps. And muscle Y is the triceps. So basically when the biceps contracts, that is going to cause the arm to lift. So when you're bending or flexing your arm, the biceps contracts while the triceps will relax. And then when you're extending your arm, the triceps would contract and the biceps will relax. So these muscles work antagonistically. So that simply means that the muscles are acting opposite to each other. So when one is contracting, the other is relaxing. So let's look at the two joints. Joint W is pointing at the ball and socket joint.
So this is the type of joint in which the bones would be moving like a ball in a socket. So you're going to have full rotational movement. So full 360 degrees movement. So this is the shoulder joint. So you can actually swing your arm right around fully. So full rotational movement at the ball and socket joint, which is the shoulder joint. And the other joint is the hinge joint. So that is the elbow joint shown there. So what I included are the tendons of origin and insertion for each of the muscle. So always remember that the tendons connect muscle to bone. So a tendon of origin would be connecting the muscle to the more stable bone. So as you can see in the shoulder joint, that would be the scapula and the clavicle. So that's the more stable of the two bones. Um, the tendons of insertion, they're connecting to the bones that are more movable, that do most of the movement. So continuing with the topic of movement, we're going to look a little more closely at the parts of a hinge joint, which is a fully movable joint. Shown here are two different views of this joint, and we're going to label the parts from the two different views. So looking at view one first, let's look at part A. A is pointing at the ligament, which is different to a tendon. Ligaments connect bone to bone. So this is the ligament, also known as the joint capsule. So you can clearly see that it's connecting the two bones at the joint. B is pointing at an actual bone. C that would be the synovial membrane which is responsible for producing synovial fluid so D, D is the synovial fluid so this is going to keep the joint nice and lubricated so you don't have the bones rubbing against each other so it helps with movement as well easy movement and then E is the cartilage. So you generally find cartilage where two bones meet at a joint. So this will also prevent friction, cause, prevents the bone from rubbing together, causing any damage at the joint. So that is the cartilage. So you're seeing two discs of cartilage, one at the end of each bone. So cartilage will also absorb some shock from movement, any sudden movements. Okay, so that is view one. So let's look at it from view two. A is pointing at the bone and if we're going to be particular in this particular um, diagram, so say this is the elbow joint, A would be the humerus. So that is the upper arm bone. B is pointing at the synovial fluid. So that little space there would represent where the fluid would be to help lubricate the joint. C is pointing at the synovial membrane. So synovial membrane produces the fluid. D is the ligament so you're seeing that it's connecting bone to bone E will be the cartilage the two discs of cartilage shown there and then we're going to look at F and G which are the two lower arm bones F would be the ulna the larger of the two bones and this is what forms the elbow, the point of the elbow at the elbow joint and then G is the radius. So that completes the parts of the hinge joint that you should know about. So moving on from the topic of movement, 
let's look at the new topic irritability or coordination and control depending on if you're doing CSET biology or human and social biology so the brain is part of the central nervous system the CNS in addition to the spinal cord and then the peripheral nervous system PNS would consist of the cranial nerves branching from the brain and the spinal nerves branching from the spinal cord so in this diagram you need to know the main parts of the brain so we have part one pointing at the cerebrum so this is the largest surface area of the brain which controls a variety of activities so it controls thought reasoning memory motor actions your sensory regions so it, it pretty much controls the majority of various activities carried out in the body secondly we have part two pointing at the cerebellum so this is the part of the brain which will control muscle activity and balance and positioning so it helps you to stop toppling over keep that balance so you can stand and walk without having to topple over so that is what the cerebrum is for so for balance and muscle activity and then the third part would be the medulla oblongata so this is the part of the brain that controls involuntary actions which basically we have no conscious choice or control over so this would include our heart rate our breathing rate peristalsis so any activities in the body which we cannot consciously control the medulla oblongata would be responsible for controlling those activities so that is the brain so staying on the same topic of irritability and coordination and control we're going to look at the functional units of the nervous system which are the neurons so these are the specialized nerve cells which are responsible for transmitting electrical impulses throughout the nervous system so we are going to label this neuron and this particular neuron is actually a motor neuron A is pointing at the cell body so like any cell it will have the major parts the cell membrane the cytoplasm the nucleus so one is the dendrites so those are the small fibers that connect to other neurons and receives electrical impulses two is the nucleus so all cells will have a nucleus with the exception of red blood cells three is the cytoplasm so these are the basic parts of the cell body moving on to four four is the myelin sheath So this helps to increase the rate of transmission of the nervous impulses through the neuron and you can see it is quoting the axon which is part six so this is a thin nervous fiber nerve fiber that is going to transmit electrical impulses away from the cell body so here you have the arrow just showing you the direction in which the electrical messages will be sent so we have the axon being that thin fiber transmitting those electrical messages from the cell body downwards and five is pointing at that little gap between the myelin sheath and the axon so therefore you have a little exposure of the axon that is the node of Ranvier So electrical messages can actually hop from node to node and then the final part seven this would be the nerve endings or the synaptic endings so this would also connect to uh, another neuron or a muscle or a gland okay so that is it for the neuron and the nervous system 
moving on to the next diagram and this diagram is one that appears regularly in the exam so pay close attention so we're still on the topic irritability and coordination and control so we're looking at the structure of the eye so let's look at the front parts of the eye part a is pointing at the sclera so where it is located the sclera would go all around the eye so that is the white of the eye your eyeball so it gives the eye its bouncy consistency its bouncy structure so a is the sclera so that entire part there that's going all around the eye so it's just pinpointing it at that point but all of that is the sclera similarly down here all of that is the sclera so A is the sclera B is the ciliary muscle so this plays a role in the process of accommodation in which the lens changes shape to receive light rays coming from objects at a different distance so the ciliary muscle can either contract or relax depending on the distance of the object that you're looking at. C is pointing at the cornea and the cornea is responsible for refracting the light rays as they enter the eye. So it's a transparent region of the eye. So as light enters the eye, the light rays will be refracted or bent. D is locating that fluid region at the front of the eye known as the aqueous humor. So that mostly contains water and some nutrients. E is locating the opening in between the iris which is G so that is pointing at the pupil so E is the pupil which would appear as a black dot when you look at yourself in the eye so when you go and look at yourself in the mirror you will see that your eye has a black dot surrounded by whatever color your eye is that is the iris so F is the lens, so the transparent part of the eye which also does some refraction and basically focuses the light rays onto the retina at the back of the eye. We'll get to that shortly. So E is the pupil and that is surrounded by G. So you can see that the pupil is right in the middle and G is the darker regions here. So that represents the iris, the colored part of the eye, which is made up of muscular tissue that would contract and relax to control the opening of the pupil. So basically the iris controls how big the pupil will get depending on the light intensity that the eye is exposed to. So in bright light, the pupil will get smaller. In dim light, the pupil will get bigger. So the iris is responsible for controlling the size of the pupil and then finally at the front of the eye we have the suspensory ligaments so you see that they're actually attached to the ciliary muscle and the lens so we have the ciliary muscles suspensory ligaments up top here connected to the lens and then similarly below so H is the suspensory ligaments and they also play a role in accommodation so they can either loosen or tighten to adjust the shape of the lens so when the suspensory ligaments loosens or slackens that lens will get fatter when the suspensory ligaments is pulled tight that would stretch out the lens and make it appear thinner so it controls the shape of the lens all right let's move on to the back of the eye so I is pointing at this large region also made up of a fluid but a little more jello gel like consistency 
So this is a vitreous humor. J is pointing at the choroid. Now the choroid is that dark, darkly pigmented region of the eye that would prevent light from scattering as it enters the eye. And you also see blood vessels running through the choroid as well to supply the nutrients and oxygen to the eye. So that is the function of the choroid. So you can see is that thin membrane, that thin region directly underneath the sclera. And then beneath the choroid K, part K, so the darker colored region here, that is pointing at the retina. So the retina plays a crucial role in receiving the light. So it contains light sensitive cells or photoreceptors. So these cells receive the light rays and then create messages which then needs to be sent to the brain. And we're going to get to that part shortly. So the retina contains the light sensitive cells. So we have cone cells and rod cells, two different types of light receptors. So the cone cells would be stimulated in bright light and allow us to see color. While the rod cells would be stimulated when outside is a little darker, not much light. So that would only allow us to see black and gray and white. So that is the retina. So the light sensitive region of the eye at the back. And then L is just pointing at a specific, a particular part of the retina. So you see it pretty much has like a little inner fold, a point, a little tip. That is the fovea. And this is where most of the light rays tend to focus. And the fovea is concentrated with cone cells. So when light falls there, usually you should be able to see clearly and see in color. So the fovea is concentrated with cone cells. And then the final part of the eye, M, would be the optic nerve. So this is the part of the eye that transmits the electrical messages that were created in the retina and transmits that to the brain. So the brain can fully process that information and allow us to see the image the right side up because typically the image is upside down on the retina but once the information is transmitted to the brain the brain would interpret it correctly and then change the image right side up so those are the parts of the eye that you should know about So remaining on the topic, irritability and coordination and control once again, we will be looking at the endocrine system here. So the endocrine system is known for secreting hormones into the blood and these hormones will regulate various activities within the body. So the endocrine system is like the second control system in the body. We looked at the nervous system being the first one. So the endocrine system will be the second control system so it sends messages in the form of hormones. So we're going to look at the main glands of the endocrine system. And the first one we will look at is A, which is the pituitary gland found in the brain. And this is known as the master gland because it secretes various hormones that control different activities in the body. We have follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that is to do with the menstrual cycle. Then you have antidiuretic hormone, ADH, that is related to osmoregulation. So those are some of the key hormones secreted from the pituitary gland. And gland B is the thyroid gland in your neck. So this secretes the main hormone thyroxine and it controls metabolism. So it controls a physical growth and also uh, mental growth as well. So that is a thyroid gland. C is pointing at the adrenal glands, 
with secreting the main hormone adrenaline and adrenaline is known as the fight flight or fright hormone meaning that it pretty much gets you all excited so it increases your heart rate your breathing rate so when you're doing any thrilling activity you're gonna have a lot of adrenaline pumped out from the adrenal glands part D is the pancreas and we would have seen the pancreas in the digestive system and I told you that the pancreas has two functions so we would have looked at the digestive function of the pancreas in the previous video well the endocrine function of the pancreas would include producing the two hormones insulin and glucagon for regulating the blood glucose levels in our body so that is the endocrine function of the pancreas part E is pointing at the well it's highlighting the ovaries in females so those are the two endocrine glands of the reproductive system of females and the ovaries are known to re, to produce progesterone and estrogen so those are the two major female hormones and they also control the menstrual cycle as well F is the testes so they're highlighting the testes in the male and this will be known to produce testosterone and it can also the testes also produces luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone as well so these are the main glands of the endocrine system that you should know how to identify and know the hormones that are secreted from each of these glands so the next diagram we will look at is the skin and this is found in the topic irritability or homeostasis depending on if you're doing CSET biology or human and social biology so let's label the main layers of the skin first so layer A is pointing at the epidermis so the topmost layer of the skin layer B is the dermis so this is actually the largest of the three layers and C is the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer or subcutaneous tissue so this is the region where you would find most of the adipose tissue so that is what you're seeing down here so all the fat cells that makes up the adipose tissue and is necessary for insulating the body all right let's go back up to the top so one is obviously pointing at the hair so that's a strand of hair that you're seeing sticking out there two is the sebaceous gland so this gland produces some oily fluid that helps to keep the skin moisturized and supple so that is uh, an exocrine gland so it secretes out of a duct so this is the sebaceous gland three is pointing at the malphigian layer of the epidermis so this is the layer that contains the rapidly divided skin cells and the layer above that would be the cornified layer containing the dead skin cells so eventually those would fall off shed would be shed from the epidermis and replaced by the new cells of the malphigian layer part four is the sweat gland so another exocrine gland so this sweat gland obviously produces sweat during high temperatures so when the conditions are hot outside you will have the sweat being produced from the sweat gland and it goes through the pore of the skin the sweat pore number five is the blood vessel so depending on the location of the blood vessel so normally veins will lie a little closer to the surface of the skin arteries will be a little deeper beneath similarly capillaries as well 
part six is the hair follicle. So that's the root of the hair. So this is where the hair is going to grow out of the skin. Seven is the hair erector muscle. So this plays a role in controlling how the hair would stand or if it would lay flat depending on the temperature. So when that hair erector muscle contracts, it's going to cause the, the hair to actually stand erect. And then part eight is pointing at a nerve ending. So this is what gives skin its sensitive nature. So there are different types of nerve endings and receptors in the skin that would respond to temperature, touch, pressure. So those are the nerve endings. So these are the key parts of the skin you should know how to label. So let's move on to the next topic, reproduction in humans. And we're going to label this female reproductive system. Part A is pointing at the uterus or the womb. B is the fallopian tubes. also known as the oviduct. C is the uterus lining or the endometrium. D is the cervix, so that is the neck of the uterus. E is the ovary and F is the vagina or vaginal canal, birth canal. So you should be able to discuss the functions of each of these parts. So you should know that the uterus, that is where implantation occurs and the growth and the development of the embryo into the fetus. So that is this entire structure here, the uterus. So during pregnancy that would expand multiple times to allow for the development of the fetus. B, the fallopian tube is where the egg would be released from the ovary. So the ovary is the organ that produces the eggs and they also produce hormones as well. So the egg will be released into the ovida and the ovida is where the process of fertilization would occur. So where the sperm meets the egg. So then once fertilization occurs, you have the ball of egg, ball of cells, sorry, moving down towards the uterus. So a fertilized egg is known as a zygote. That zygote undergoes a series of cell division and then it implants itself into the uterus and that begins the process of pregnancy. So then the cervix, the neck of the uterus, so this would usually dilate um, when the mother is about to give birth, going to labor. And the vagina is the, the main sex organ. So this is what would receive the penis during intercourse and also the exit for menstrual blood and the birth canal for the baby. So that's the functions of the vagina. So remaining on the female reproductive system, we're going to look at the menstrual cycle, focusing primarily on the levels of hormones that control the menstrual cycle and then the name of this process A. So let's label process A first. So you're seeing what is happening within the ovaries of the female reproductive system. The changes occurring in the ovaries and you can clearly see that the follicles are growing over the 28 day period. So if you look at the bottom here, you have the start of the cycle and the number of days involved in the menstrual cycle. So a typical menstrual cycle is around 28 days. It could be a little more or it could be a little less but 28 days is the average amount. So what you're seeing here in the ovaries 
you're seeing the very small follicle enlarge over the period of about 14 days. So when that large follicle, known as the graphene follicle, when that matures and the egg is fully ready to be released, we're going to have that egg exiting the graphene follicle and being released. So that is known as the process of ovulation. So that's what process A is highlighting there. So ovulation, the release of the matured egg from the graphene follicle of the ovary. So then after that egg is released into the oviduct, you now have an empty follicle and this is known as the corpus luteum. So it's pretty much just a follicle lacking the egg and eventually if pregnancy does not occur it starts to degenerate. So let's look at the levels of hormones. So let's label hormone 1. So you will notice that hormone 1 is relatively low and starts to increase over the 14 day period. So just before day 14 you see a rapid increase, a rapid spike of this hormone 1. So this hormone is actually estrogen and it is secreted by the graphene follicle which is found in the ovary. So you will notice that there is this increase in estrogen approaching ovulation time. So the purpose of estrogen is to repair the uterus lining after menstruation. So menstruation is when you have the uterus lining breaking down and being shed, being removed from the body. So estrogen is needed to help repair and build that uterus lining back up. So that's why you're noticing the increased levels over the, those period, that period of days approaching ovulation. Now the second hormone represented here, and you're seeing is very low and then there's a huge spike around day 14. And day 14 is typically when ovulation would occur if you have a 28 day cycle. So day 14 is the middle of the cycle. So we have hormone 2 being the luteinizing hormone. So often known as LH. So this hormone increases rapidly approaching um, ovulation because this is what triggers the process of ovulation, causes the egg to be released from the ovary. And then you would notice that hormone 3, the levels are relatively low throughout the cycle with a very short spike, very small spike around day 14 as well. So this one is the follicle stimulating hormone. Also known as FSH. So as the name implies, it stimulates the growth of the follicles. And we're talking about the growth of the, the graphene follicle, which should be carrying the egg. And then the final hormone would be progesterone. And you will notice that progesterone levels only increase after ovulation. So that is after day 14. And that increase is happening because we're trying to maintain the thickness of the uterus lining. So that is the purpose of progesterone. So progesterone comes from the corpus luteum and helps to maintain the thickness of the uterus lining in preparation for pregnancy. So those are the four hormones responsible for regulating the menstrual cycle. All right, let's move on to look at the male reproductive system. So we're gonna label the parts A to I. So what I'll do, I'll just put in the labels first and then I'll go through the functions for each part. So part A is the bladder. B is the vas deferens, or the sperm duct. C is pointing at the seminiferous tubule. D 
D is the prostate gland, so that's right underneath the bladder. E is the urethra. F is the epididymis. G is the testes. So one testes with the I. Plural would be testes. H is pointing at the penis, so that is the head of the penis. In some books you may see glands penis, so the head or the tip of the penis. And obviously this part here that I'm pointing at would be the shaft. And then finally I is the scrotum. All right, let's talk a little bit about these parts and their functions. So I'm going to start with G, H, and I. So we have the testes, which is responsible for manufacturing the sperm. And you will notice that there are two testes and they're both housed in the scrotum, which is I. And that scrotum usually hangs outside of the main body cavity so that the testes would be under a slightly lower temperature than the main body cavity because the sperm being manufactured in the testes they need a little lower temperature to survive to uh, multiply so they don't like heat so that's why it's important that the testes hang outside of the main body cavity to prevent that excess heat so the testes where the sperm is made the scrotum houses both testes and then the part F which is the epididymis that is where the sperm is going to go to mature and then is stored until it is ready to be released during ejaculation so ejaculation is the release of the sperm through the sperm duct which is the vas deferens part b so we see a sperm duct running from each epididymis so as the sperm travels through the vas deferens it is going to collect some fluids from the glands seminiferous tubules and the prostate gland so they're going to help nourish the sperm provide a medium for the sperm to swim in as the sperm is leading on its way down through the urethra out through the penis so when the fluids mix with sperm it's important to note that that is called semen so that is what is being ejaculated from the penis through the urethra so the combination of the fluids from the prostate gland the seminiferous tubule and then there's another gland that is not shown in this particular diagram called the accessory gland or the Cowper's gland so those three glands produce different fluids to help with the mobility of the sperm and to help that sperm to swim to swim and nourish the sperm so that semen would come out through the urethra out of the penis all right so that is the male reproductive system so let's now go back to the woman's reproductive system and we're looking at a pregnant woman so this is after fertilization occurs so when the sperm from the male fertilizes the egg from the female that begins the process of baby development so we need to know how to label the structures within a pregnant woman so let's look at these structures so one is pointing at the placenta so this is like the baby's life support. This is where you have an exchange of materials. So nutrients and various substances would go to and fro from the baby to the mother, from the mother to the baby. So the placenta is a very important structure, important organ. 
So that is what is attached to the uterus of the mother. And the uterus is actually part seven. So let me put that in. So we know that the uterus is the womb and this is what is going to carry the baby in the duration of the pregnancy. All right, let's go back to number two. Number two is pointing at the umbilical cord. So this is what is attaching the fetus to the placenta. So the umbilical cord has arteries and veins and that is what facilitates the movement of nutrients and oxygen and different substances to and from the mother and the baby. So the umbilical cord. So when this is cut after birth, that forms the navel. Part three, that would be the amniotic fluid. So it's basically pointing to that region. So that fluid region that surrounds the fetus. And as you can see, five is pointing at the fetus. And what produces the amniotic fluid is the amnion. Or you may sometimes see amniotic sac. So this amniotic fluid and amniotic sac or amnion is extremely important in protecting the baby during growth within the mother. And it helps to prevent against shock, sudden movements. So it helps to absorb that shock and pretty much cushion the baby during pregnancy. And then number four is pointing at the cervix and you can actually see the cervical plug or mucus plug right there in between the cervix. So that is really to protect the baby from any incoming bacteria and viruses. So that's why you have this mucus plug at the cervix. So that usually would come out just before um, birth. And then finally, part eight would be the vagina. So this would be the birth canal where the baby would pass through during labor. All right, so those are the parts of the pregnant woman. All right, let's move on to the next topic, reproduction in flowering plants. So this only applies to CSET biology students. So we're gonna look at the flower structure. So the flower is the reproductive organ of flowering plants. So let's label these parts. So number one is the petal. So this is the colored part of the flower, usually scented and attracts insects and birds to the flower. And this is useful in pollination. Number two is the filament. So that long structure there, which attaches three, the anther. So the anther and the filament forms the male part of the flower. So those two parts form the male part of the flower, which is known as the stamen. So the anther is responsible for producing the pollen grains and the pollen grains carry the male gametes. So during pollination, pollen would land on the stigma. So that is part four. So we're going on now to the female part of the flower. So the stigma, part five is the style that attaches the stigma. And that leads down to the ovary, which is part six. And then seven is the ovule. So eight is pretty much highlighting the female parts of the flower, which is the carpal.
So carpal, also known as pistil. So those represent the female parts of the flower. So the ovule is what will be carrying the female gametes. So obviously we need to have the male gametes from the pollen. That pollen lands on the stigma and that pollen grain would germinate, grow a pollen tube down towards the ovule. So you need to have double fertilization occurring. So this will begin the development of the seed and the fruit. So the ovary turns into the fruit, the ovule turns into the seed. So that is the flower structure and you should also know how to identify a wind pollinated flower versus a insect, an insect pollinated flower. So this diagram is showing an insect pollinated flower. As you can see the large conspicuous petals, a wind pollinated flower has smaller petals if any at all and usually the stigma is feathery and the anthers they lie loosely they hang loosely outside of the the flower all right so we'll finish looking at the flower structure so let's go on to look now at the structure of the fruit so this is after pollination and double fertilization occurs so you have to understand how to label a fruit so let's look at that now so this is a typical fruit, um, an avocado pear, and remember the fruit forms from the ovary. So after double fertilization, the fruit forms from the ovary and then the ovule turns into the seed. So the pericarp is just the ovary wall and that is broken down into three parts. So A, the outermost part or the flesh of the, the skin of the fruit is known as the exocarp or the epicarp so either one could work B is the mesocarp the middle region of the fruit so in this case this is the juicy part of the fruit the, the part of the fruit that you really would be eating and then C is the endocarp so that's the inner layer just surrounding D, which is the seed. So those are the parts of the fruit. So the last diagram we'll look at here now is the seed structure. So we label the parts of the seed. So remember the seed is formed after fertilization, double fertilization in the flower. So the seed comes from the ovule. So let's label these parts. Part A is the testa, the seed coat. B is pointing at the plumule, the young shoot. So that's the green part of the seed. So when that comes out after germination, that is the part that will turn into the leaves and the stem. C is the radical which is the young root. D is the hilum. So this is the scar tissue left behind. So this is where the seed would have been attached to the ovary. Part E is the micropyle. So this is the opening, that little opening remaining in the seed after fertilization occurs but is important prior to fertilization because this is the opening where the pollen tube is going to grow through and enter the ovule so that double fertilization can occur so that is that tiny opening there and the micropyle also serves the purpose of allowing water to enter the seed during imbibition so when the water comes in and this is the first stage in seed germination so the water needs to enter the micropyle and that causes the seed to swell up and then breaks the testa and that is the beginning stages of germination so that is the importance of the micropyle and then F is the cotyledon 
So this is the majority of the area within the seed and where you would have all the nutrients being stored. So starch and fats, proteins. So all these nutrients are stored in there and you also find enzymes. So these nutrients are necessary for the growth of the embryonic plant. So that is the purpose of the cotyledon. So we've come to the end of these diagrams and I hope you have a better understanding of all the uh, diagrams that you need to know for life processes section.